Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Robert, and I'm a first year at the college, and I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on the JFK Street side of the forum and the park side. Um, in the event of an emergency, walk to the closest exit to you. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Please take your seats now and welcome me in join in wel join me in welcoming Anika Bagaria, who will be introducing our guests. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. Uh, my name is Anika Bagaria, and I'm a member of the forum's outreach team. I'm a current sophomore studying statistics and government here at the college, uh, and I'm from Princeton, New Jersey, though here on campus I live in Courier House. Uh, so today we live in politically tumultuous times with clear division present over some of the most crucial and pressing issues facing our nation today. With regards to the pandemic, we see vaccine mandates in California, yet anti-mandates in Florida. From climate change and the Virginia election to the Texas ban on abortions and social safety net expansion, the intersections between national and state politics are becoming increasingly complex. For our forum this evening, titled Why All Politics Are National, we are joined by a panel of distinguished journalists who will help us navigate these intersections. And so it is my great honor to introduce our guests, Amy Walter, who serves as the editor and publisher of the Cook Political Report, and Sungmin Kim, who is the White House reporter for the Washington Post, covering the Biden administration. For over 25 years, Ms. Amy Walter has built a reputation as an accurate, objective, and insightful political analyst with unparalleled access to campaign insiders and decision makers. She began working at the Cook Political Report in 1997 after her years of hard work and countless significant contributions and the nonpartisan newsletter was then retitled The Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. And Ms. Walter now serves as its editor and publisher. Additionally, as a weekly contributor to the PBS NewsHour, Ms. Walter provides political analysis for the viewer favorite Politics Monday segment and also provides critical insights for their election and convention events. Ms. Walter also serves as a regular Sunday panelist on NBC's Meet the Press, CBS's Face the Nation, and Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace. She was also the former political director of ABC News. Sungmin Kim covers the Biden administration and its relationship with Capitol Hill as a White House reporter for the Washington Post. She has extensively analyzed and covered some of the biggest legislative battles in Washington for over a decade, ranging from fiscal standoffs and government shutdowns to the comprehensive immigration reform debate and multiple Supreme Court nominations. Before joining the Washington Post in 2018, Ms. Kim spent over eight years at Politico where she primarily covered the Senate and immigration policy. She additionally served as a reporter and online news producer for USA Today, also reporting on the state of Washington. And finally, moderating our conversation this evening will be Mr. Dan Balls, the chief correspondent at the Washington Post and regular panelist on PBS's Washington Week. Throughout his career, he has been the recipient of several renowned awards and including many on the coverage of politics, uh, to name just a few, these include the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism and the Robin Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time and for being here today. And I hope everyone here really enjoys and learns a lot from our conversation this evening. Thank you, um, and uh, thank all of you for braving the weather and coming out tonight <laughs> on a lousy night. Um, we are pleased to have you here. Um, we're obviously doing a reversal of the famous Tip O'Neill line that all politics is local. Uh, as Anika indicated, um, increasingly what we see is that all politics are national. Um, you know, from a, an abortion law in Texas to school board protests in Virginia and elsewhere, uh, to wildfires in the West and floods in the East, all pointing to the problems of climate and the demand for action. And all of this competing for attention while President Biden tries to get his agenda, his domestic agenda, through the Congress. Um, all of these together, I think, highlight 
you know, the state of our politics right now, the, the state of our divided politics, the state of our democracy, uh, the state of the two political parties, uh, each fraught but in significantly different ways, um, and, and obviously the question of how all this may come together uh, as we look past what's going on right now to 2022 and some very, very important midterm elections. So obviously tonight we're, we're painting on a very, very broad canvas, uh, deliberately so, and we will try to bring it down to something on a more manageable level. Uh, I, I'm so happy we have, we have two of the smartest uh, and most plugged in people to cover all of these topics, White House, Congress, national politics. Uh, my colleague Sung Min and my longtime friend Amy, um, it's, it's a delight to have you both here. Um, we're going to talk for, you know, roughly a half an hour and then we will throw it open to your questions. Uh, we will get to that in a minute. Um, I, I want to start with um, current events, obviously, because these are, there are things that are happening right now that are so shaping uh, in the direction of our politics. So I'm going to want to start with you uh, on the Biden agenda. Um, and you have covered this um, so closely, uh, painfully closely probably, <laughs> <laughs> for so long. As we sit here tonight, where are we? What is the state of play? <laughs> That's Painful so easy. Question. Yeah. Right. Softball question. You've only been asked this a hundred times. Right, I know, right. But. Well, today just seems especially um, frenzied. And I say this as a person who actually wasn't even up on Capitol Hill today, but just taking care of a few things and, uh, and preparing to come up here. But it's just the thing to understand, first of all, about any Congress is that they work best under deadline. And the deadline that they're facing right now, um, there's two kind of critical pieces that's forcing the Democratic Party to actually kind of finally come to terms with the parameters of what they can pass with the, with the structure of the Senate and the House that they have. Uh, which is that, first of all, uh, President Biden is leaving uh, for Europe in the next couple of days to go on his second overseas trip. And this is one of the, you know, I've, I've only covered a small handful of foreign trips since um, I haven't been covering the White House directly for too long. But this foreign trip, um, unlike, uh, unlike a usual foreign trip, is so overshadowed mm -hmm. with his domestic agenda, which has mm -hmm. been a really interesting dynamic to observe to see how sort of my everyday reporting on the prospects for his Build Back Better agenda is really affecting his global agenda. So a couple of points there. One is that one of um, President Biden's guiding principles, and this was a big theme that he stressed when the bipartisan group of uh, senators was able to reach a uh, was able to reach a deal on the traditional roads and bridges infrastructure legislation. He was not only touting that this is important for you know obviously re rep repairing those potholes in your town or um, you know, d doing other infrastructure related projects, but he really wanted to send a message to the world that despite all that is going on in Washington, despite January 6th, despite the messy politics of the 2020 elections, that democracy, that bipartisanship can still prevail. And that's what was really important to him. And for this trip, what is also driving this too is that um, he has told lawmakers, and it's been made very clear that he wants some sort of uh, transformational, expansive climate change or climate plan in hand when he goes to Glasgow for COP26, the climate summit, which, will, which, which he will be headed to after he uh, stays in Rome for a couple of days for the G20 summit. So to see his, um, his domestic agenda and legislative agenda kind of intertwined that day is really what's kind of pushing mm -hmm. uh, Democratic lawmakers right now to race to a deal, just like following a, a kind of the state of play of what's in, what's out, how much is this costing, where's the decimal point going on this tax rate? It's just been basically a giant game of whack-a-mole. Like you feel like you fix one problem and then another problem pops up. And, and, and that's just been such a really confounding puzzle for Biden, for Democratic leaders. And the other big um, deadline, which we'll also talk about extensively, is the upcoming Virginia governor's race um, on November 2nd. And while the off-year um, gubernatorial races in Virginia and New Jersey are often kind of the bellwether especially for a president's, uh, a president's first term in office. This just feels so much more heightened now, um, and I'm sure you guys would have better perspective than that. And um, it, it was actually Democrats in Virginia that really t 
tie in terms of the tying Biden's legislative agenda to Virginia politics. It was Terry McAuliffe and Mark War Terry McAuliffe, the Democratic candidate, and Mark Warner, one of the Democratic senators representing Virginia, who began making the public case that we have to get something done in Washington. We have to pass the bipartisan bill. We have to get Democrats excited in Virginia about what a Democratic Washington can provide, boost uh, President Biden's poll numbers. So those two things are driving just kind of the frenzy, the craziness, and the ever-changing uh, dynamics right now. I'm sure once I look at my phone, there'll be like a new tax rate in play <laughs> or something <laughs> um, as, as people continue to negotiate. So I mean, you, you, you raise the issue of the climate agenda mm -hmm. um, and I think everybody here is interested in the role that Joe Manchin right. has played, not just broadly in this battle, but specifically on the climate issue. Mm -hmm. has, he, has he affected what they're going to be able to put together that it will compromise the president's ability to talk about climate and the role of the United States when he goes to Glasgow? So I think there's certainly sacrifices because specifically of Joe Manchin, of the, of, the, of, of the nature of his state, the fact that it is a major coal state and he has specific priorities that way that Democrats had to sacrifice. So one was the, the getting rid of the Clean uh, Energy Performance Program, which was a kind of a broadly supported um, program for most Democrats. Um, the way that it's being shaped and climate is one of those things that I think the latest update that I saw was that they're close, but they're not there. <laughs> so, we'll <laughs> see, so we'll see what happens and if that kind of, if that uh, changes in the next hour or so. But um, Democrats still feel pretty confident that they, the President Biden could be able to tout the spill. And also he has also touted a lot of the provisions in that separate bipartisan infrastructure piece as a way to transition, for example, um, to encourage use of more electric cars and, and, uh, and affect, uh, the, uh, combat the, the effects of climate change that way. But uh, the Joe Manchin dynamic, not to mention the Kirsten Cinema dynamic, has just been a fascinating, uh, fascinating one to cover because it's, it's like what President Biden said at his very candid CNN town hall last week in Baltimore when he said, if you're in a 50-50 Senate, every senator can virtually be president, which is true, and we've seen that dynamic play out over the last, over the, over, since, basically since uh, January 20th, but also because, um, and this has become much more evident um, over the last, um, you know, couple of months in the negotiations over uh, the Build Back Better package, is that Manchin and Cinema, they're often grouped together, but they're two very different Democrats. Um, they have two very different kind of styles, uh, different priorities. One person, one senator described it really well to me as, um, in terms of the in terms of uh, uh, the progressive view, you know, Cinema's good on tax or good on climate, bad on taxes. Manchin is good on taxes, bad on climate. So it's like kind of this whack-a-mole dynamic that we just talked about. And again, like when you don't have a single vote to spare, it's just been this, this really complicated puzzle for leadership to figure out. Amy, I wanna ask you about the Biden dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the way I would structure the question is, uh, in thinking about the way he has handled this pair of packages, uh, has he been shrewdly patient <laughs> or has he been detrimentally passive in the way he's wow. dealt with it? <laughs> uh, and and um, assuming, which we never should do, but assuming they get all this put together and it passes, does any of that matter? Does any of it matter? No. That's a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> it's a, it's well, a lot that's why you're here That's tonight. why we're here. <laughs> um, so I, I think we start off with where the president sits today and where we thought he might be sitting back in April or May. Um, one of my favorite quotes, besides the tip O'Neill, all politics is local, which now, except that it's not, um, <laughs> uh, comes from Mike Tyson. And um, he said this in response to, I don't know much about boxing, okay? So I don't know the person he was fighting, but it was a person who was older, Mike Tyson was kind of in his prime, and the person he was fighting said, well, you know, I think I can do this. I can beat Mike Tyson. I'm really prepared. I have a whole plan. And Tyson's response was, yeah, everybody has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And <laughs> that's kind of what happened with Biden, right? Which was he had a plan that looked pretty good in April. 
It was, we're gonna get COVID under control, the economy is gonna come back, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of momentum going into, you know, after the hot vac summer, <laughs> and we're gonna come into the fall, and everything is gonna be awesome. I'm gonna have these strong approval ratings, my party's gonna be behind me, we're gonna have enthusiasm, and we can get this stuff on track. But starting in June or July, as COVID became, un unfortunately, m much, less of a hot vac summer and much more of a kind of like hot mess summer <laughs> with Delta variant, the economy, people becoming much more wary of things like inflation, we saw supply chain disruptions, consumer confidence dropping. And so he didn't have that momentum coming in that I th think they expected him to have. Uh, and also I would argue that momentum helped pass the first COVID um, relief bill where they did have to muscle people like Manchin and Cinema into agreeing to a package. So there was a little bit of history as well as a little bit of expectation about this. And when that fell apart, and as the president was struggling to try to deal with vaccines, Afghanistan, um, you could just sort of watch as all of this then process became much more complicated. The Democrats that I talked to on the Hill, obviously, Sungmin talks to many of these same folks. They felt frustrated for a while, especially the moderates, about how the president had sort of not been more actively engaged, that he needed to come in and just put the parameters in place. But I just think um, at, at the end of the day, the decision to make a transformational piece of legislation pass a Congress that is as evenly divided as this one with no room to spare was a huge risk. And I think maybe they knew that we were going into it and they just said, this is a risk worth taking. Um, or maybe they didn't appreciate that even though the party is unified, it just takes one person to make that unification thing fall apart and that it is more complicated than it, than it looked. So um, I don't know that he was a passive actor as much as he had a belief in being able to do something that was one, historically would be like nothing that had ever been done before, passing something this big, this bold, with only three votes in the House and zero votes in the Senate to spare, and then coming into it with approval ratings that had been dragged down over the course of the summer. Yeah, I mean, one has to assume that uh, among other things, they had probably thought um, in the end, Democrats are not gonna kill the president's exactly. agenda. And right. I think right. that's, and they just that's make it, a, And that will probably still be the case, but it is debilitating when we talk about the enthusiasm challenge for Democrats, especially if you're a Democratic voter and you're so excited to see Biden's elected, you got a Democratic Senate, everything's chugging along, and then like, who's this Joe Manchin guy? <laughs> like, <Right>. why, <laughs> why is he more powerful than the President of the United States? I don't understand this. Yeah. Um, Amy mentioned the, the COVID issue and the problems that have transpired on that. Um, the President came in and all his people basically said, this is the be all and end all issue for us. We have, we have to deal with COVID in an effective way. And for a time, they seem to be doing that. Since then, they have had struggles. They've had some confusing signals. They've had setbacks because of, of the Delta variant, battles over you know, vaccine mandates, et cetera, et cetera. To what extent do they see themselves having a real problem on that issue now in the context of what they had hoped would be a real asset mm -hmm. for the president heading into 2022 compared to where they are today. Do you have a sense of that? Right, well, they know that, so President Biden always talks about kind of the four crises that he inherited or, or that, that he knew he needed to tackle um, once he went into office. And they know that um, his handling of the pandemic will really define, you know, not only the 22, 2022 midterms, but obviously his presidency. Because you know there are a lot of uh, you know there there are a lot of factors um, that led the that led the 2020 outcome as it did, but obviously one of them was how President Trump handled the the pandemic. 
Um, which is why I think you saw, what's been interesting to observe about uh, President Biden and his administration's approach to the pandemic is just how like when things weren't working, how much more aggressive they have had to come because the issue of mandates and the series of mandates that they've imposed on federal workers, on businesses that were rolled out, I believe it, it's probably been about a, at least a month or so now, it was several weeks ago. Uh, that was, a, th those were steps that they were really initially hesitant to take. Um, but they saw, well, first of all, uh, what White House officials love touting is just uh, like all this data from, for example, private businesses that imposed, uh, that imposed vaccine mandates and you have like 99.7% of its employees becoming vaccinated at the end of the day, that's what they're trying to highlight. And they know that if there were to, if they were to take any sort of short-term political hits over kind of this new phase of mandate politics, if that helps get the broader issue under control of the pandemic, then that's, you know, obviously good for the country and but obviously a political win for the long run. Yeah. Um, President Biden, as we speak or, or around now, is in Virginia campaigning uh -huh. on behalf yeah. of Terry McAuliffe. Um, Amy, this is a state that has been moving in the direction of Democrats since Barack Obama won it in 2008. Right. And they've scored important victories in 2017, in 2018, in 2019. And President Biden won the state by 10 points a year ago. Right. Why is Terry McAuliffe in trouble? And what is this telling us about the state of things? Yes. Um, so there are two trends that are crashing into each other right now in Virginia. The one is in an off-year election, which Virginia is, as is New Jersey. Um, going all the way back to the 1970s, the party that's in the White House loses the governor's race. There's only one person to have broken that streak <laughs> since I think it was 1973, and that was Terry McAuliffe in 2013. So you have history now that suggests that, again, it's like what we see in midterm elections, the party in the White House tends to lose in midterms, not simply because the person in the White House may be unpopular, but because there's just an enthusiasm imbalance. Right? People who win tend to like take their foot off the gas because they're like, great, we won, we feel good, we can kind of sit back and relax. People who lose are still really upset. And everything they see around them only you know, reaffirms how terrible it was that they lost this election. Um, so that's the, that's the one trend. And the other trend though, as Dan pointed out, is that Virginia has become much more democratic, certainly since, uh, e even during the Trump era, um, certainly since the Obama era it started, but it got even bigger during the Trump era. These margins kept increasing. And so um, those two things we always knew were gonna come up against each other. The big difference, and this is what we're gonna get into, is that the, the, the nationalization of politics means that it's not simply, you know, who's more enthusiastic, who's not, what is, um, how much is the state changed, but how well is Joe Biden doing? How do people feel about the president? What's happening in Washington? And more important, can Donald Trump, the person who has dominated all of our lives for the last four years, continue to be a motivating factor for Democrats, even when he's not in the White House anymore? So as you saw, um, Biden's approval rating starting to drop. You could also, if you talk to Democrats who were involved in this race, they could feel the enthusiasm start to drop too. Um, you know, not as excited, not only because they won, but because Biden, eh, you know, maybe he's not doing such a great job, we're not so keen on that. And can fear of Donald Trump still work in a time when He's no, not only just not in the White House, but he's not on Twitter anymore either. He's not a daily presence in our life. And I think that's what we're gonna be testing. Yeah, I, I, I spoke briefly with McAuliffe on Friday, and one of the things he said was that Trump was in our face for four years. Right. He just, you know, every morning he woke up to his tweets and he dominated the conversation. You know, reporters on tweets and they're angry and they're, but he's not, doing it in a public way. Uh, and the Democrats around that race are very worried that people don't fear the Trump presence, 
presence as much as they did. As Democrats on the Hill are looking at this race, what is their biggest concern? What are they worried about? What are they looking for as they assess whatever the outcome might be? I think the biggest immediate concern for them beyond just the prospect of losing, uh, losing a governor's race that they should probably win is just the immediate impact on, that it's gonna have on their agenda. Like I said, you know, oftentimes these off-year elections Tend to uh, tend to be bellwethers, signal where where the where the electoral mood is at this moment. But there is a major piece of legislation that's being formed right now, and you know Democrats, particularly in Virginia, because Virginia also does have very critical swing House races that we're always watching um, as potential uh, as as the as the House um, you know as there's a very narrow uh, fight for the, the control of the House next year. But what's been interesting is just to talk to Democrats, House Democrats particularly, about what impact that a Terry McAuliffe loss would have on their agenda and their efforts to pass um, the, the big uh, social spending climate package. Uh, one person has told uh, one, of my, one of our colleagues that um, it would be a quote Scott Brown moment, yeah. um, which is obviously the former senator yeah. who upset, uh, who who won the who won the Senate seat here after Teddy Kennedy's death, and made uh, and made Democrats at the time lose their 60 vote majority in the Senate. So there, that's how much they're looking at this race, correctly or not, as a as a, how, as a as a measure of how much people want President Biden's agenda to happen right now, um, which also may be why they're trying to get a framework in place very quickly over the next couple of days. But there's, but that kind of immediate impact, I think we will see, you know, on late on the night of the third or, or second or early on the third, if that were to happen. Um, and I think that's something that Democrats are extremely worried about. And obviously, does this, is this a sign of a terrible midterm for Democrats? Uh, already they're, they not only are dealing with just the historical um, trends of uh, a president in his first midterms not doing well, obviously we saw that for Obama and for Trump as well, but also just the fact that Democrats in the House are dealing with um, uh, redistricting issues um, and whatnot. So just compounding all of that, how bad, I mean, how, this early out and cautioning that it's early out, I mean, how bad does this seem for Democrats in 2022? That's what really, uh, folks on the Hill are going to be watching. Yeah. Amy, pull back, pull back a bit um, to, to talk a little bit about so how everything did become nationalized. You, yeah. you used, used the term hyper-nationalized politics. How did that come about? What is it? And, and what kind of an effect is it having? Yeah, I, it's a really good question because I don't know that I can answer exactly how it came to be this way, but I think, you know, you and I can now talk about the olden days. Sungmin, you have sort of older, oldish <laughs> days. Um, I'll take oldish. Where, <laughs> yes, where um, there, was always a, there was always a nationalized part of politics, right? What was going on if we were in the middle of a war or a recession, something like that, it was gonna impact all the way down a ballot. But where you had individual candidates who were able to sort of separate themselves from what was going on in Washington or from even what was happening within their own party. I, you look back from the late 50s through the mid 90s and you had about 100, 120 districts that were split ticket districts, right? Where the member of Congress represented a district that the presidential candidate of his or her party did not carry. So you had a lot of red members of Congress in blue districts and a lot of blue members of Congress in, in red districts, and they were able to do that in part because of the Tip O'Neill adage, right? They were able to sort of be seen as something separate than what was going on in Washington. So you could hate the person in the White House, but still like your person. That whole like, well, I hate Washington, but I like my congressperson. And I think when we started to see the rise of the internet and of cable, the loss of local news, it was harder and harder to become your own person, right? You were then lumped in with the national. And I would see this even in my interviews, Dan, you know, when I would 
interview candidates in the 90s, most of the time where you would start is what's, what your district is about, right? They're gonna come to Washington. I have a big military base in my district. We're an ag heavy district. We, I learned about fish ladders. Do you know about fish ladders? <laughs> I had to learn about those because that was like the big issue, right? In some of these uh, specific districts. It was a great way to learn about America and all the different <laughs> things that matter to different people in different communities. And that's what they were coming to Washington to do, right? Now, they were also coming, they had to vote on big national issues, but really my job here in Congress is to look out for my district and the biggest interest in my district is X. Okay, fast forward to today and most of them come in and talking about the national issues, right? We gotta get rid of Obamacare. We gotta get rid of Trump. We have to fill in the blank, whatever the big national issue is. And it's very hard to be distinctive from your party. Since the direct election of senators, um, we have only had one time, and that was in the 2016 election, where not one single Senate candidate won in a state that their presidential candidate of their own party did not carry, right? No blue person won in a red state, no red person won in a blue state. And so um, that I do, I, as I said, I do attribute it to one of the big reasons is the sort of death of local media and that all politics has become about cable, that we've siloed ourselves thanks in large part to the, um, to the internet. And I think, you know, uh, the, the ability of sometimes unscrupulous people uh, to take advantage of that and to fan it um, has, uh, and then finally, one last thing would be um, that the, our primaries, which used to be kind of sleepy affairs that wouldn't get much attention, um, they've now really become um, a place where the uh, sort of most fervent supporters of each party um, serve as gatekeepers who can come in and, and who can't into our party. So you combine all those things together and it just makes it very hard for members of Congress to separate themselves and even all the way down to the local level. I mean, we were watching ads back in the Obama era at the state legislative level talking about Obamacare, right? They have no impact on Obamacare, but they talked about it as a signal for how they were aligning themselves that you know you, can, you like me because I'm aligning myself with this national uh, fill-in-the-blank party issue. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, I want to. I mean, Amy's talked about kind of how that has broadly affected everything. Uh, one question I had, uh, from the perspective as you watch these things, an issue will bubble up, and it's like it's the issue, it's the hot issue that's going to take over politics. Whether it's the again the Texas abortion law or right. how Gavin Newsom, you know, won his. Right. beat his recall election by focusing on COVID and what was happening in Florida and Texas. Um, you know, cancel culture was, you know, the Republican, you know, silver bullet right. some months ago. Mm -hmm. We hardly hear about them talk about it. Maybe it'll come back. As these things come forward, how are, how are politicians and the people who are dealing in campaigns trying to think about, all right, this is really an important issue or this is going to be something that's gonna fade away mm -hmm. and we're gonna be dealing with something more important? Um, that's an interesting question. I think on the, especially on the issues that are motivating Republican voters right now, especially in the governor's race, I do think just from talking to um, Republicans who are work kind of working kind of tangentially in that race and are watching it closely, I do think GOP officials do want to find a way to win and get their base excited without Trump. And that is obviously the Republican Party has been driven by their, you know, the Republican Party and their base voters, um, you know, still approval uh, of Donald Trump despite his being out of office. And he has, and Trump has driven so much of the party loyalty and party politics and, and still commands such approval from his party. But, you know, especially if you want to win in swing states, that, that's kind of the, the trouble that Republicans are confronting. So I think they're really looking at this Virginia race as a way, because 
especially Glenn Youngkin, the Republican candidate, has, especially as we've pivoted to the general election, tried to you know, not talk about Trump, as Terry McAuliffe says Trump over and over. Um, what are the issues that will get Republican voters out without having to invoke the former president over and over? Um, and, and, and you see just how dominating Donald Trump right now is in primaries. And it's just, we're, so we're kind of in primary season, obviously, as the filing deadlines start to creep up and you have more and more names, you know, throw their, you know, throw their, throw their names in the ring and you see where in races, um, you know, Trump is starting to pick his choice and does that kind of collide with what McConnell's thinking? And it'll just be really interesting to see, especially in some of these Senate races that do have very conservative primary fights, but are swing states in the general, you know, what, how it, if, how much do these, you know, primary candidates who have talked so much about President Trump for the run-up of the race, how they kind of pivot to the general and if that still gets them to win. And there was just one, and I'm, I'm kind of rambling here, but there was like one statistic recently that I found just so fascinating, me, me being in Iowa and, um, and just having, you know, Chuck Grassley, the, the senior Republican senator, as my senator virtually my whole life, um, there was a, um, because this was when Donald Trump held an Iowa rally uh, in mid-October, I believe. So around that time, there was a Des Moines Register poll that came out, and it was Donald Trump who actually had an approval rating that was 10 points higher among Republican voters than Chuck Grassley, who was like Mr. Iowa through and through. And I just found that so fascinating how, you know, 40 years of public service in your state visiting all counties in your home state every year, right. that, you know, the, the personality and the presence of Donald Trump is still gonna Trump that, right. sorry for the terrible pun, but yeah, it's just, it was just really interesting. Yeah. Yep. Um, really point. We're gonna go to questions in a minute. Um, there are microphones here and here, and I guess up, up, yeah. So there are four microphones. You can start to line up if you have a question. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna do two things. One, which is relatively quickly, although it's not a simple issue. The threat to democracy is a real issue around the country. And I wonder if each of you could briefly assess how much people should be concerned about that or how much it's hyperbole. Yeah. Um, Amy, you wanna start on that? I do, I feel like I struggle with this all the time and so are academics and practitioners about are we really at this tipping point or is this just part of the give and take that we have, we have in this country and um, both sides, though, see that we are at a tipping point. Um, you asked Republicans, UVA did a great uh, poll a few months back asking Trump and Biden voters how, about that very question. And 75% of them believe that the other side is a threat to the sanctity of the democracy, right? So what my position might be on what is the threat to democracy is gonna look very different from somebody else's threat to democracy, right? For Democrats, they say it's clear Donald Trump represents an existential threat to democracy, what he did after the election, sowing doubt about its accuracy, continuing to claim with no evidence that it was rigged, blah, 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 obviously January 6th. He is, it's pretty clear that what that threat to democracy is. Republicans look at the agenda that Democrats have put forward and they say, we are heading very quickly to a socialist um, society. We are going to live in a world where, you know, we do not have the freedoms that we once enjoyed. Um, they're shutting down dissent, cancel culture, critical race theory, et cetera, and people can't, you know, talk out openly about things. So, um, it's clear that, that we have the two sides that believe this too. It's not just this conversation that we're having here in academia. Um, I'm uh, of the school that it is both of those things, <laughs> which is kind of a cop out, right? It can both be a real threat, but there's also a bit, it's, I don't know if I'd say hyperbole, but there's things that we don't know yet. So 
part of the challenge in assessing any moment in time is we don't have a very good roadmap. A lot of times we use past history, but we know that history, while it can repeat itself, never does so exactly. And we also live in this time of such tremendous technological change, right? It feels like every minute something else is under, um, the, the, the sort of undercurrents are constantly swirling. And so what seems at this moment in time like an intractable situation, our incredible polarization, this belief from both sides that the other side is an existential threat to the country, that those things while they're there may feel different, and again, doesn't even necessarily take an event or a person to shift the, this, the way that in which we have this conversation or where things are moving at this moment in time. We just aren't very good, even though we like to think of ourselves as that, we're not very good at predicting the future. And I think about this country as just this incredibly dynamic but resilient place where, yes, we do some really dumb things. Yes, we get ourselves to the, to the edge of the cliff a lot of times. But it doesn't mean that we are going to end up in this sort of level of violence or other fears that some people uh, could have. Yeah, that's a really what good answer. Say? Yeah, I think the one thing I would add, just from just from my perspective, especially as we report out, um, just kind of the state of play with these issues um, every single day, is that obviously, um, you know, as reporters, we deal in facts. So mm -hmm. when um, you know, it's hard to see whether this is a trend along, you know, a, a long-term trend and what the impact would be. I'm not sure a lot of us would have predicted January 6th happening the way that it did. But what we can do right now just as reporters is acknowledge, and I think we do, that there is a leader of one political party who is not saying the truth about a free and fair election. Um, so our kind of role in that, especially as that, especially as that spreads and he may run again in 2024 with perhaps that as a platform, um, what we can do in the, in the current time is just be adamantly clear about <laughs> what happened in the 2020 right. election, which is that Trump did not win. Um, and, and to, just to do our part as people who, you know, deal in just basic fact to just spread that as much as possible. Because again, you know, there are not only, as Amy pointed out earlier, not only um, at the not only is there a decline of local news and what and there's just the increase of unreliable news sources. I mean, you there there you know some you scroll through social media and there are like kind of real sounding news sites that may exist, yep. but it's really not. And, yep. and, um, and, and so much, I mean, media literacy is something that has to be learned. Um, so I think what, so from at, at least in the, in the current, what we can do is just really be explicitly clear when you do have someone who continues to not, you know, convey the truth about the election that this was not it, it is not what Trump said, um, because we've seen over the first, you know, we've seen in the nearly years since he lost that this is something that he's not, he's not going away into the night, he's not going quietly, he, this is, he, is something that he's gonna continue for some time, and this is something that he's going to be um, aided by, by his allies, and, and kind of, at a minimum, not stopping what he is saying. Yeah. Great. Um, we're ready for questions. Um, we have very few rules here. Um, <laughs> identify yourself, tell us your affiliation uh, here at Harvard. Uh, no speeches, uh, questions only, and uh, if you can make the questions as short as possible, uh, that would be great. So, um, we'll, well, we'll start here. Hello. Uh, my name's Hillary. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm a food service worker over at Harvard Business School, and thank you for coming. Mm. Um, you touched on a lot of really important points from the increase in um, polarization, democracy being at stake, um, a variety of things that I feel like are 
directly tied to uh, the tech industry, and today they were before Congress testifying, um, you know, on a lot of issues, Facebook papers and Instagram, so forth. Yeah. I think that's a major part of what's occurred last few years, in my opinion. Yeah. What do you think is going to be the future of regulation on them, since there's only so much media literacy individuals yep. can be responsible for? And um, how do you think that will affect the next rounds during the of election cycles? Who wants to take that? Um, it is the question, right, of how, how do you regulate this industry, which Congress has just been incredibly slow to come around on. I mean, especially, it's one of the rare issues where Democrats and Republicans both agree, like, we need to do something about this, and then there is something that stops real forward movement on it. Some people make this claim, oh, it's too complicated. You know, members of Congress, they're old, they don't understand tech, <laughs> right? And uh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, it was like, you know, members of Congress don't know about a lot of things, right, that they regulate. <laughs> they also don't know how to drill for oil, right? Like, there are complicated things, like taxes. They figure that out. This isn't, that's not what this is. Um, so I do think that, but they're coming at it from different angles too, right? So you have Republicans coming at it at this idea that they're being censored, right? That what, what the real danger of tech companies isn't that they're promoting or silo, this siloing of Americans and creating a more polarized society, but what they're really doing is they're silencing voices that they don't like. So we have to stop that. And on the Democratic side, it's they're a threat to democracy, right? You can't let Donald Trump go and say these things on Facebook. You can't let people traffic in this anti-vax um, conspiracy theories. And uh, there doesn't seem to be a way to like figure that out. It all comes down to, you know, we know that this is about an algorithm, right? The part of what got us in trouble with these devices is they, they're AI. They learn what you like and they'll serve more of it up and more of it up and more of it up and it becomes harder and harder than to disentangle yourself from the, whatever path they put you down. But you can redo that, but it would require a business model change, right? And that fundamentally is the challenge, I think, for all of us when we think about, like, what are the incentive structures that are out there right now? The incentive structure and the business model for cable news for the tech companies is towards this um, clash and keeping people outraged and keeping people engaged, right? The friction, 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 friction. It's not, no, nobody's gonna, you know, keep a tune to a show that's about like, we all agree, everybody's awesome. This has been fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, to be able, I don't know how you regulate that. Do you say you have to redo your algorithms? I don't, I don't know how that would actually work, but that seems to me pretty clear what the, the challenge is. You have thoughts on this? I, I no, nothing really okay. can go beyond that, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. I'm a little short. Uh, I'm Victoria. I'm an MPP student here at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, and I'm from Texas, a state that's made a lot of noise uh, <laughs> lately. Um, and that's what my question is about. You're seeing a lot of activity in, in Texas with these abortion laws and Florida. I think the governor said he would give money to police officers right. who didn't want to comply with mask mandates. A lot of action um, at the state level. And my question is, to what extent do you think this is virtue signaling in a yeah. political environment that values flash over substance? To what extent is this um, these dialogues happening at the local level because there really isn't a productive platform at the national level, and to what extent is this a product of um, COVID and state powers, state emergency powers, and all these decisions on our daily lives now giving governors and local officials a greater platform than they've had in recent memory? You want to try that one? Um, 
I think it could be many things. I think it is the extent of the big power that governors had in terms of containing COVID in their respective states. I mean, I know this doesn't touch the abortion issue, but in terms of the pandemic and kind of the various restrictions, I think it's a lot of that. I also do think that um, if you're thinking, if you're talking about strictly politics, a lot of governors in Republican states are angling for a broader national portfolio and, you know, taking a very strong stand, whether it's, you know, on abortion or mask mandates is one way to, um, it, it is one strategy to kind of obviously, you know, stand out from the crowd in that um, as we, you know, not too close, but as we eventually head to a 2024 election race, especially if um, Donald Trump doesn't decide to run again. But I think it's a lot of those things. I think um, a lot, it's just, again, like seeing the power of governors in it, over the last, you know, year, year and a half, and just how that kind of interplays with, you know, Republican politics at this time. And it is fascinating because yeah. this is like an intra-state debate as well. Right, and there, there's always been, um, fights within states about, you know, Philadelphia has always hated Pittsburgh and Northern Virginia and the rest of the state hate each other, all of that, but, and have different values and priorities. But now what we're seeing is like, it's literally these different pockets in states, right? So you have um, suburban area, a suburban area in Dallas is not much different than a suburban area in Philadelphia one in Seattle, one in, in um, Northern Virginia or Atlanta. Um, so they have more in common with each other, right? A suburban Atlanta person has more in common with someone in Seattle than they would someone 20 miles away in a more rural part of the state. And how do you govern in that, right? You Do you then say, well, boy, to win, I got to find a way to find the some something of a sweet spot here between these two or do i just exacerbate that right because i know i got to keep my base excited and the only way to keep my base excited and to win is to just focus on those issues that i know they care about um and that's what's going to win this there are enough of my people in the state that i can win and and that's where the real um challenge has become that we're we're this divided red and blue but it's like it's not so clear cut, it's not as regional as it once was. It's not, when people talk about flyover country, I think that's not fair. I think, as I said, it's, if you're in Des Moines or you're in Chicago, it's very different um, from how people in the state um, and your governors are talking about some of the issues that they say are, you know, Midwestern values issues. To you. Thank you. My name is Joanna Petrescu. I'm a senior fellow here at the Kennedy School, uh, and I'm writing a book about adolescent democracies. And my question uh, for you is related to this threat to democracy. So it seems to me that um, that U.S. is uh, uh, is looking more and more like a new democracy from the point of view of the low trust it has towards its institution and the U.S. government. So to what extent do you think that this low trust reduce trust, diminishing trust in the U.S. government is a threat to democracy? <sighs> well, that's a big piece, right? I do think that's a big piece of this. I, I wrote about the, the, um, a little bit on this the other week where um, there is uh, a, a book I had just written um, by women who is, makes this really interesting claim about trust and about you know, institutions, right? We've had a lot of discussion about the loss of faith in institutions in this country. That's been going on for the last 30 or 40 years. It's not just government, it's everything. It's banks, it's colleges and higher learning institutions, et cetera. And her point is that, well, we're at the end of the institutional trust era. It was the fir very first, it's the second of our trust eras. We're now in a the first was the local trust, right? You only tr trusted people you knew exactly or were part of your tribe. Then we went institutional, these big things that you didn't know people necessarily, but you trusted the institution. And now we're moving to something she calls distributed trust, right? Which is you're trusting people on the internet. You're trusting, I mean, it's sort of, the, I find this so somewhat ironic, right? We don't trust the government, but you do trust um, someone to give you a house on Airbnb 
and stay there. Could they come murder you later? They could, sure. I mean, I don't know, right? Like you put stuff, like our level, our decisions about what we trust and what we don't are really not commiserate with what is a threat and what's not. So there's still, I think it's a, another way of saying we trust different things now. The institutions themselves have sort of lost their way to many Americans, but that doesn't mean that the, 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 um, the government will then cease to function. I think it has been hollowed out in a certain way and it has changed from what it originally was meant to do, the parties specifically. But now what we have is um, a more small d democratic idea, right? People feeling like they can get engaged and should be allowed to be engaged. We see more and more people now giving money through the internet, right? Billionaires are still a very important part of who's funding campaigns. But these low dollar donors now have contributed to such a degree that a Bernie Sanders who nobody took seriously, who didn't have any institutional support, could get very close to winning the nomination. Um, you do have people now who are much more, re who are um, uh, helping to organize, whether it's protest in the street, over the internet, that start over the internet, to bring direct democracy to the fore, to bring issues up that wouldn't have been covered by the traditional news media. Um, so in that sense, you, so you can look at it to it, right? You can say, well, the media is terrible, everybody hates the media, the government's terrible, everybody hates the government. And at the same time, you're also just seeing a different kind of engagement and a different way of um, interacting with both of those institutions that I think is different and that's okay. It's, it is going to be a, it's a 21st century reality now. Um, it doesn't mean that we can take our eye off the ball on letting <laughs> this democracy fall into something much more um, dangerous, but it does mean we have to be okay with accepting that it might not look exactly the way it did in 1962 or in 1877, you know. Um, <clears throat> we're nearing the end. We have two people lined up, so we'll try to yeah. take both of those questions. Sir? Uh, I'll make it very brief then. Um, my name is Carlos. I'm at the engineering school uh, working on AI explainability. Oh, good. So and you can explain it all to us. <laughs> hopefully the AI will be able to explain itself. <laughs> um, uh, da -da -da. It's a good one. We'll design it to explain itself. That's, uh, that's, I that's think the, that's the hope. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering... Um, about any uh, guidance on how uh, uh, the engineering and the kind of data geeks should be helpful to the regulatory process? Is it regulatory comments or making things more accessible? Uh, we're certainly doing something wrong. <laughs> I, I don't want to speak for everybody. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, when you think about people who are coming to testify on the Hill and engaged on the Hill, I would, the, the, these committees that are in charge of this are invested in talking to those people. Right, right. right yeah. I don't think the issue is that they're not talking to the right people. I think they have got a lot of people around them who uh, are knowledgeable, who are able to break this down for people like us who don't have engineering degrees and uh, in an in a, in appropriate way. But that um, the, the the bigger challenge is how do you regulate an industry that at its core is about speech, right? And, th and that, it's different than regulating like gas and oil or uh, how, if you have to have a seatbelt in your car, right? Like that's an easier thing to talk about than you're really regulating this sh sharing of ideas. And particularly difficult in a environment that is it's as, as polarized, polarized as, as, this. as we are, yeah. as, as you guys have said, that people are coming but at But for the AI, right, different. like, can you do that so that instead of an algorithm that just feeds you exactly what, you know, all this stuff that takes you into your silo place, that it, that it somehow can, can take you into different directions, yeah. right? Thank you. Hi, how are you? My name Hi. is Tarina. I'm a sophomore at the college studying political empathy and the chair of the civics oh. program. 
Uh, my question is, I'm a Virginia oh, resident, Northern Virginia, so I'm very much following this race. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, we're we are both, both Arlington. We're both Arlington. No way, yeah. Loudoun County. Um, okay. <laughs> but given a young kin victory, what would that mean for Biden's political agenda? Will he lose legitimacy? Will the Democrats lose legitimacy? How are they gonna have to navigate that world? Well, because, well, it'll be, I mean, it's already being spun as um, from from every which direction as a judgment of Biden's agenda, and we and we talked about it a little earlier. But you know, obviously, McAuliffe has because nationalizing this race can only help him because again, Virginia won or Virginia went for Biden by about ten points. Mm -hmm. It has been much more solidly blue than it has been in the past. So the more that he can invoke Trump and get the Democratic voters in rage, the more popular that Biden is. You know, McAuliffe was caught on tape kind of complaining about how, you know, Biden's lower approval ratings had dragged him down in recent weeks. The more, um, the more progress that can be done on key priorities, at least, and uh, you, you know, you're not gonna pass voting rights the next day or so, but like whatever you can do to kind of bolster the broader party standing in Washington. So because that narrative has kind of been set, I mean, Youngkin winning would just be an indictment of all that, which is why Democrats, especially the the Democrats who I don't I don't talk frequently to the ones who are directly working on the race, but obviously the members of Congress in Virginia are watching it very closely, and which is why they're so not not necessarily scared, but very nervous about um, just what that would mean. Um, and I do think. Um, and I would really also just be, and we may never know, but just what the White House would say to a Yunkin win, because mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, after the California recall when Governor Newsom was able to pull that out pretty easily, but there was a question about how, you know, how what his prospects were going into going into that recall date, and you know. And California is, you know, the bluest of blue states, obviously. But I remember kind of, um, I remember the the White House press secretary saying, you know, after after the recall results were in, that um, if it, she was asked at a briefing, you know, does the White House have any takeaways on Governor Newsom's win? And she called it one she, in one way. She called it a validation of how mm -hmm. President Biden, the White House, had been handling the COVID pandemic because Newsom had you know, allied himself so much to that. So, so if, you know, if things go south for Democrats in Virginia, which is a much more of a bellwether nationally than California would be, I would just, um, it would, it, it would, it would be really, I mean, obviously it would be very tough for the Democrats on, on multiple levels. Yeah, that's when they say, oh, it's all local. Right, right. right. <laughs> it has nothing, it's a Virginia race. It has it nothing, nothing to, do. to do with the president. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why you would ask that question. That's, <laughs> that's what their answer will be um, yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, but an indictment is a very good, but much like the Scott Brown thing, right, which was a, not only a canary in a coal mine, but it threatened to derail the legislation. I feel we're too far along now <laughs> to do that. Mm -hmm. And that the real question is between if Youngkin did win, I think the the biggest impact would be on the Democratic caucus, and there would be like an absolute freakout of like, oh my God, if we can't win in a state this blue, we're all gonna go. Should we retire? Should I just not run this year? If I'm a candidate thinking about running for office, so um, there's that. And then, but it really comes down to at the end of the day. Um, can a, uh, uh, a, a President Biden go into the fall next year with an economy that's looking better in, a, in an electorate that is more optimistic that we've turned the corner? And when you hear some of the economists and they're talking about inflation is still going to stick around and supply chains are still going to be gummed up, it doesn't feel like we're going to be in a great place. Could, could not, it, that may not be the case, but that's a bigger challenge, I think, for Democrats and for the administration. Well, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. We've not covered nearly all of the ground that uh, could Wanda. be covered, um, <laughs> but we are out of time. We're a little over time. So, um, Sung Min, Amy, thank, thank you very you much. Guys. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you.